Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Benoit, and I am an Al-Anon. Hi, y'all. I came into this magnificent fellowship of ours February the 7th of 1969. And, uh, yeah, in about, I don't know, three weeks, I guess. You know, it really burns you when you have three weeks and you can stand up for 49. Yeah. So I am, I have a sponsor when I came in. Her name was Pat Clater. She was my sponsor for 40 years until her passing. And then I got a lady that everybody calls so sweet until you're sponsored by her. It's a whole different thing, isn't it? And uh, her name is Nell Largent, and she lives in Warica, Oklahoma. And I have a home group in Denton, Texas, called the Unity Group, and I have a home group in Los Angeles called the Stepped Up Group. So there's my credentials. And disclaimer, I have been fighting this nasty, nasty, nasty condition called visceral vertigo. And I mean, for seven months, it it, it makes you so dizzy and you stagger. I, I crawled back and forth for a while and I've had it seven months, housebound seven months months, enough to make any sane person crazy. So, this is my very first trip out in seven months. And I really wish I could tell you exactly how that feels. I wish I could tell you, but there there is no way. I want to thank Cynthia for I mean, she is above and beyond a speaker, chairman, host. She's just magnificent. She has taken care of me in every way, form, fashion. It's just unbelievable, your kindness. I mean, really. And Cheryl, God love her, (laughs) she came to get me at the airport. And I got in at 1.30, and my companion, Brenda, from Los Angeles, who pushed me around that wheelchair all weekend, she didn't get in till like, 3. And customs, I mean, we're not used to customs. It took her two hours in customs. And they kept saying, we'll take you on the hotel and come get us. I said, oh, no, um, I'm going to wait. I told her I'd wait, and I'm going to wait. Cheryl stood there and sat with me for, what was it, three hours? Four hours, something like that, and uh, has carted us around, and you just, you're so beautiful and so kind and so loving, and thank you. And Dave, I don't know about Dave. Did he show up for the meeting? Yeah, there he is. (laughs) For those of you who weren't here earlier, I was in my room we had just had a little coffee. I thought I better kind of chill out because I kind of overdid it yesterday and got a little bit too sick. So we were just chilling out. And I swear, it sounded like a bomb went off on my door. Boom! Boom! And I peeked out, and it was him. He said, you're supposed to be at the meeting. Excuse me? <laughs> you're on the panel. You're supposed to be down there. And I said, Okay, and let me tell you, I take, I am a very vain woman, and I take at least 30, 45 minutes to put on makeup and do my hair and get cute. I was ready in seven minutes and out the door. (laughs) Oh, thank you. And I want you to note the time because I ain't paying for that other 30 minutes. I ain't, that, this is my time, mister. (laughs) 
And Mari, I, one of the reasons I wanted to come so desperately I was to, to sit with Mari, your speaker tonight. You must hear her, please. Oh, please don't miss Mari. She is just, she carries a message that's beyond a message. She is just the dignity and grace of AA, the love of AA. I just feel better being in her presence. She's so supportive of me, and uh, I just love you so much, and I'm so glad you're in. Y'all are going to be in for a treat. And Marty, I've known Marty for many years, and he hadn't got any smarter. Um, <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, right this minute, this day, right this minute, I am so in love with recovery. I didn't, it hit me this morning. I am so in love with recovery. I love the music that's here. I love sitting in a meeting. I had no idea how I wanted to sit in a meeting. Just sit here. I didn't have to do anything. I just wanted to sit here. Because I believe that my healing starts now at these meetings. I think it starts now. And it's just, it's overwhelming to me. And right this minute, this day, I am so in love with God. I mean, he got me here, number one. And look around at the beauty. The beauty just, the beauty is astounding. And I had, I lived in a little shack out in the country with two kids in an old car and I had to carry water in a big gallon jug to put in the radiator halfway to town so I could make it to town. And here I sat out on the porch this morning looking at Porte Vallarte. Is I'm saying that right? Porte Vallarte? And I, it just, how in the world did I get from that little shack to here? It's impossible. And we got to talking about the places. I have been so many glorious places. Uh, just because I'm really, really sick. <laughs> I was born in Lubbock, Texas. I heard a few sneers when they said Texas, and let me tell you, don't sneer around me, son. Um, <laughs> I love Texas. I love my home. I love the AA there, and it, it's, it's just fascinating. And I uh, had a mom and daddy and three brothers. My oldest brother broke his neck when I was a kid. And um, my daddy lost everything, uh, paying doctor bills. It was many, many years ago. It was in the 50s, I guess. And uh, it was very confusing to me. I was farmed out to different people while they were taking care of him. We were in Oklahoma when they, he had a swimming accident, broke his neck, left him, left him paralyzed. And I was with different people all the time, and it was just strange, and I was lonesome, and I was scared. And our house, when they finally did come home, I don't mean to be all that dramatic, but this is just the truth. It smelled bad. My brother's rotting flesh, and it was rotting flesh. And then stuff that they put on top of that. And it was, it was not a pleasant place. And my mom and dad were stressed and strained to the hilt. And so I just stayed outside all the time. I just was lonely and felt different and uh, didn't know much. And I got a little bit older, and I run into the bigger girls, older girls. This probably 16. And uh, they said, why don't you go, go, come go with us? And I did. I had to lie to everybody to get with them. But I walked into the most, I think, the most glorious place. I still think the most glorious place place on earth there is nothing to compare your dreams come out I mean it's glorious and it's called a West Texas honky tonk <laughs> man I walked in there and I smelled and it smelled like rotten flesh and medicine on top of rotten flesh and old urine and smoke and little dried blood here and there and I thought Oh, this is so exciting. And uh, they told me how to do it. What you did was you sit around and you watch and see what happened and pick out one. 
and watch him and see where he is and see how he's going, see if you can maneuver and kind of get in that area. And um, at closing time, you make your move, and they taught me all this stuff. And uh, I didn't know what I was doing, so it was fun with me. I didn't know how to dance, but I'll tell you, the first time I got on dance floor, I was a dancing queen. It was God-given. I could dance, any dance. I was, I mean, it was amazing, and it changed my life. The last dance, they always play sleepwalk. I don't know if y'all know what that is, but that's a guitar, a steel guitar. And it goes, the music goes into your bones. You just vibrate. It just, it's in the air. There's electricity. And I can do it. I hope I don't fall and kill myself here, but I can do it. Now, some of you have seen this. When I was first in AA, I heard an alcoholic talk about taking his first drink and how it changed his life. He took that, he felt ugly and insecure and pitiful and had pimples, but he took his first drink and he said it went down and it went boom. And then it came back up all through his body and all of a sudden he had muscles and boom, he was a man. When he said that, I knew exactly the feeling and exactly what he was talking about. I mean, exactly. It was on that dance floor. It's closing time, it's the last dance, and it's sleepwalk. I'm dancing with this tall, good-looking guy. He's going to be it. I am already in love with him. And he's the one. This this is it. I'll marry him for fairly soon. This is it. <laughs> and I mean, he's a little drunk. That's okay. And uh, <laughs> we are in the position. I mean, we're in the position, and he's just right here. <laughs> and I mean, we're and here's sleepwalk, and here's me. And he reaches down and he whispers in my ear, Sugar, I need you. <laughs> Boom! Boom! <laughs> Boom! Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? Right? <laughs> nice and love. And I figured out how to do it. The big girls had told me about a night like this, and I, I did it. And I knew my grandma was, if she ever knew me, because I was going to hell that night, I knew it. And I, my grandmother had told me, if you ever do that, you're going to go to hell. And I thought, well, I'm going to hell, but <laughs> sure was a good, <laughs> good exit. And um, the next day, he was gone. I thought, what? You know, how, what? So I waited till the next weekend. Now there's a smorgasbord of alcoholics in a bar on this side of the room in a West Texas honky tonk. And there's a dance floor in between. And we sit over here and we scope them out. And you get your one, you manipulate, you work and you get to it and you get to that last dance and here you go. And I met my second, going to be my husband, second one. Next day he's gone. You know what? I tried that over and over, trying to figure out how to keep him there. <laughs> and I lovingly call myself, because this is the truth, in my search for my fix that I had that very first night, I kept looking for it and looking for it and looking for it. I changed from beer to whiskey to wine to whatever. I kept looking for it because I knew it was there. That feeling was there. I just had to find it. And I became a slut puppy hoe.
And out there, there was this guy who was, um, he's different from other people. I noticed when he'd come in, everybody kind of back off. He wore a suit, not a cowboy hat like most people do. And one night he walked by and his suit fell open and he had a shoulder holster with a pistol in it. That is so exciting. Oh my God, he is so exciting. And I found out that he was a bootlegger. That was his profession and a professional gambler. This is getting better and better. And one night he walked by my table and threw down a $100 bill. And I had never seen a $100 bill in my life. And I was extremely impressed. The next day, I went to the, you'll know, you'll figure this one out. I went to the drugstore in Helena Rubenstein's Heaven Scent perfume. A bottle, all, you know, Heaven Scent? I, I think you do. Are you old enough for Heaven Scent? You know. I'd never had it before. Whoops, I can't do that. And I smelled so bad, people just made a path when I came <laughs> But I was so excited, my first bottle of perfume ever in my whole life. So, wow, this is the one. Sure enough, he was. I didn't care so much about the gun after we got, you know, into a meaningful relationship because he was a dangerous man. He was an extremely dangerous man. He was a bad alcoholic. He did things that that I wouldn't even I wouldn't even repeat. He he was close to one of the sickest people I ever saw. And and I thought, this is it. I became pregnant by him, had my daughter, was in the hospital, and this man was violent. He he whipped me. He had a blackjack once and got after me and I covered my head, but he got my shoulders and back. He stabbed me once. He cut off the little tip of his ear. He shot at me. And I'd go right back to him. I would think, oh, he saw how bad it was, so he won't do it anymore. I had this child, and he came by when I was in the hospital. He said, I want you to come by and get your stuff. I've done all I can do for you. I mean, dump me. Well, that's when I found out about what we talk around here. The word alcoholism, and they talk about the isms, the characteristics that make up the alcoholic. And my great-grand sponsor, Marcy White, from Lake Whitney, Texas, said she discovered that al have isms too. And we made a list of them. Some of them y'all might be familiar with. Control. We control everything. Uh, we ni- ma- manipulate. We're vindictive. We have no sense of humor. Uh, we're fear, 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 fear. Nags. It goes on and on and on and on and on. Well, when he did that, my first thought was, I've got to, I've got to get him back. I've got to fix this. Because I had ruined my family. I mean, I had no, they didn't want to even see me. And I, I was just, I've got to fix this. I don't have anywhere to go. So I started flaunting myself in front of him with a man that he absolutely hated, another gambler from the other side of town. And I thought, he will see me, and he will be so jealous that he will come back. Now, he didn't like this guy anyway, so it was a perfect guy to flaunt in front of me. I, I had no idea, nothing, nothing, the depth of his insanity. One morning, they knocked on my door. My friend knocked on the door, and she said that the gambler had just shot the guy that I was out there with and took a shotgun and blew half his head off. Now, that doesn't happen in real life. It just doesn't. And the sun was coming up as she was telling me that, and I looked, and I noticed that the sun was going back. She was, but I just noticed the sun was going back down. I thought, how strange it's going back down. And I had such a pain in my throat that I couldn't swallow. I couldn't, I couldn't take a breath. 
And how I knew to do this, I don't know, but it was like, boom, denial. Hide it. It didn't happen. Not your fault. Back off. Just walk away from it. And I said to her, well, that's too bad. And he died in a few days later. And I carried that throat thing till I think it was eight years in the program before I got rid of it. Well, it was all over the newspapers. It was everywhere. I went over to my mother's house with my baby, and the door was locked. And that door was never locked. And she walked up to the door, and she said, we don't want you coming in and out of here. We don't want our neighbors to see you. And if anybody asks if you're our daughter, please tell them no. I said, okay, Mama. I understood that. I mean, I really did. They were they're just good, hardworking people that lost everything and they'd come back from my brother and they're Southern Baptists. And if you're any Southern Baptist in here, you know, you can't do anything wrong. Nothing. You're not supposed to. If you dance, you're going to hell, you know. And so I knew their faith was so tight to them, and, and I was very sad about it. I go, and I leave there, and I thought, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, you know, you can think of things. I thought, I will clean up my life. I am going over to the rodeo grounds and see about the cowboys. <laughs> All red-blooded Americans. At the time, they had just started tearing up the flag, and the rodeo announcers said, cowboys don't tear up the flags. Cowboys, blah, blah, blah. Aha. Clean. I wanted to be clean. And they were clean. So after the rodeo, there's a big concrete slab, and there's a fence around it, and there's a band over here. And all the cowboys lean against this fence, and all the cowgirls lean on this fence, we look at the smorgasbord, and we pick out who we want. And I picked out the cutest bull riding guy you've ever seen in your life. And manipulated and got that last dance, and this is it, this is it. And we had one of those romances that it's just a joke. A joke. One night we were at the honky-tonk, and he was doing this to me, poking me in the chest with that finger. I picked up a quart bottle, empty quart bottle of beer, busted him over the head with it. He hit the floor, and I figured out it's a pretty good time to just go ahead and exit. So <laughs> I took off. He caught me out in the parking lot, swung me around, and I thought, here it comes. And he said, you know what? I think you just knocked some sense into me. I think we should get married. <laughs> Do you hear that? He said we should get married. Now, I know. I know what I am. I know that I, I, I became what I called just pure old human garbage. And, and I rolled around in the garbage. And those kind of things would never happen to me. And when he said married, flash, flash, flash. Oh, I'll bake kitchens, uh, cookies. I'll make some curtains. He'll go mow the yard, we'll go to PTA, and I mean, it was just all instant. And it, it didn't take a week till I had that old boy married. I mean, it was a week and we were married. And I think it took another week before a Friday night he was going to go out to see a fishing buddy or get a fishing pole or something, and he was gone for the weekend. The whole weekend, and we hadn't been married two weeks. And that's when it hit me. That's when it hit me. It's me. It's me. I don't, I, it's just me. So I had a new set of plans to try to figure out. You got to go find them. You got to hunt them down. You got to pull them out of the bar. You got to get the blondes out of the way. I mean, there was always blondes involved with him. I mean, blondes have been the bane of my existence. <laughs> Real ones, I mean. <laughs> I had a son. This will keep him home, a son. I did everything that all of us do, everything. 
read books about how to dress in cellophane and, you know, <laughs> candles and drugs and ointments and candles. I did everything trying to keep him home, and it, it, just did, it didn't work. thought it was me. It's me. It's me. He worked out of town at this particular time, and um, he was coming home on Friday. I still had two black eyes and a busted lip from the weekend before. And I was rocking in a chair, and I thought, I can't do this anymore. I just can't. And I had read in Ann Landers a letter that a woman had written in about her drinking husband. And to my memory, it said, call Alcoholics Anonymous, which I did. Talked to the lady, and she gave me a number, and this other lady answered, and she said, come over. And she was a sober member of AA. And a little bit, her sober husband came in. And they talked to me about what y'all do. They talked to me about my husband. It, it kind of irritated me just a little bit. It seemed like right off the bat they were on his side <laughs> and not really understanding what I was trying to explain to them. The kindest people. Kindness is my word this year. I mean, I've seen it, heard it, experienced it. Over. I mean, it's just like comes in every direction. They were kind. They made arrangements to take me to my first meeting. They picked me up and drove me to the clubhouse, and he got out and went to the door of the clubhouse, and he opened it up and held the door back and stopped and looked at me, and I stopped and looked at him, and I thought, what's he doing? Why didn't he go in? He's just standing there, and he was looking at me, and I was looking at him. And then he said, oh, and he did a sweeping gesture for me to go in the door. My first encounter with AA, this man had mistaken me for a lady, and he was opening the door for me. I was astounded. Some of you won't know, some of you will, but it was like what Rock Hudson did for Doris Day. I saw that, and I thought, that's golly, and that's why it just was foreign to me. And I went in, and I walked through the door, and at the back of this long little vestibule was an old-timey cigarette machine where they put a quarter, <laughs> a quarter in, and it had all these packages, the little packages on the front that had lights, you know, of the red pale males and the green Winstons and all that, and it was just this glow. And these two men were leaning up against that, and they were laughing, talking to each other. I mean, laughing. And I, I stopped dead in my tracks. I had not heard laughter in so many years that I had forgotten the sound of it. And I just stood there. I was amazed at their faces and at the sound and the waves of that. I, I was just amazed. And he and the lady came in behind me, and she said, let's go in this room. So she took me into the al room, and sat with me. She had never been to an al meeting before, I learned, and never had gone back to another one. But she sat by me, and I have never forgotten that. To this day, I look around the room to see who somebody new that's sitting by themselves. I will either go sit by them or invite somebody to sit with me. That's one of the most gracious things, so touching, that she sat with me. She didn't want me to be alone in there. I can't tell you what they said. I have no idea. I don't know. But I know this. I like the way that I felt sitting in that room. There was something in that room that was truly magical. I read it. Somebody gave me the book, The Prophet by Cahill Gibran. And I read in there, and there's a page that says, Say not that God is in your heart, but that you are in the heart of God. And I thought, that's what happened. That's where I was. I couldn't put a label on it at the time because I didn't believe God. I quit believing in him. I don't know if I ever did believe in him, but I quit believing in him when I was a child or a lot of things that happened. There couldn't, there couldn't be a God like this. But I wanted what was in that room desperately. And so I kept coming back. I'd sneak in and right at the last and 
run at the just the minute they said amen, I was out of there. And two of them, there was two doors, two of them stationed themselves to catch me. And this little teeny tiny lady named Pat Clater chose the door that I chose. And she stopped me and she started talking to me. Now I had noticed her because she, people were always around her and she said these great things. I could understand what she was saying. And she asked me if she could meet me for a cup of coffee the next day. And she did, and she talked to me, and I was really um, kind of taken aback because she was a nice woman, a sweet woman, a good woman, I thought. (laughs) And um, I don't know how long it was. We wonder. It's probably around three months I announced one night that she was my sponsor. And she's kind and sweet and good. And I know there's something really that changes when they're your sponsor. I mean, it just changes, and uh, they get kind of grumpy from time to time. (laughs) And I, she told me some things that she wanted me to do. I never hesitated, not once. To this day, I can easily say I never disrespect, oh, I did one time, disrespected my sponsor. I never spoke to her. I never argued with her. I never talked back to her. If she asked me to do something, I did it. And a lot of times I thought, she's just crazy. She's punishing me. She's mad at me. But I would do it because I never wanted her to ask me, did I do it, and say no. Because I love this woman. I really did. She was, she was my God for a long time. And she told me that she realized that it was okay. That if I believed that she believed, I was going to be all right. And there would come a day when I would have that sorted out. And, of course, we went through the steps. And, of course, I had the 12th step come alive for me. I did have a spiritual awakening. And they first, I think, nine months was my first convention. And I fell in love with that. There was speakers, Chuck Chamberlain, Elsa Chamberlain, Clancy, um, Johnny Harris, Ramona B. from Oklahoma. I mean, there was the giants of the time. Bob and Marcy were there. Just the giants. And I was trying to stay at the back of the room. I just, I just, I'm sorry to be so weepy. I really am. I just wanted to be in the room. I wanted to be in this room desperately because there was there's this thing in the room. It's I don't know how, what to call it. It's the air. It's this, there's something. I mean, it was said. David said it day. If you want to see God, look at this God's kids. And I just I just ate it up. I just absolutely ate it up. And I had been going about a year when this drunk cowboy, he was not happy with me. He noticed the change, and they told me that he would. And he tried stopping me from going. And they told me what to say to him. They said to tell him that I was having a problem with his drink and didn't have anything to do with his drinking. I was having a problem with it. And that I would go. And that from this day forth, you, you're not allowed to lay a hand on me. Uh, If you do, I I will leave. And I don't want to leave because I love you. And they told me right off the bat, this woman came up. She put her hands on my shoulder. She said, it's okay to love an alcoholic. And those little sentences, those things, those gems, in an instant, my life was changed forever. In an instant. Forever. And we, uh, he minded me. He did not lay a hand on me for several years. He knew I wasn't going to quit going to al and he finally got into that. He tried AA for six months. It wasn't for him. One night he came in, and let me tell you, one of the first miracles I ever had here was sleeping through the night. I just slept right through the night. He came in and he switched the light on in the living room, And I slept soundly, but I heard that light. I heard that switch. 
And I knew something really bad was coming. You could just feel it. It was bad coming. And he was walking real fast. He jumped in that bed and he started beating on me. And I got all tangled up and I was trying to, and I finally fell off the foot of the bed and I looked up and in an instant, my two kids were standing at the door. My little son was just crying and flailing and my daughter said, Daddy, please don't hit her again. Please don't hit her again. And I got up and escaped and I was done. That was it. And I did leave him and I did get a divorce. And you know, I was always planning to leave him as soon as, you know, just as soon as the car paid, as soon as, you know, kids are out of school, soon as, as soon as. I didn't care what it took that night. I didn't care. I knew I had to leave. I knew I had to. I hadn't seen my kids before that. I literally didn't think they saw anything. I'd tell them to go back to their room. I just didn't, and I saw them for the first time years after I was in the program. And I'm a high school dropout. What am I going to do? Well, God has a plan. I mean, he has it laid out for me way before I know about it. And when I get to the point that I'm ready, he just, here he is. He opens the door. As Tom Officer says, he kicks down the door to get you where he wants you to go. He will kick down the doors. Don't worry about it. And he kicked a lot of doors for me, and I got in nursing school. I don't know why. I, I never dreamed of being a nurse. I get car sick. <laughs> Bedpans? No. But I, I was in nursing school. I graduated, and they asked me to give the client's response. I looked out in the whole front. All, all this audience here was my AA family. And right in the middle of them sat my mother and my father. And I looked down, and I was thanking the family for supporting us. And I saw my dad turn to the neighbors that they had invited, and he said, that's my kid up there. Now, and that's because I did what y'all told me to do. That's all. I just come in and, I just come in and sit down in a chair. And that and it happens. I don't do a lot. I come in and sit down in a chair, and y'all tell me, and it, it happens. It's amazing. I took. I was able to take care of my dad when he was dying. I was able to take care of my mother when she was dying. It was, you know, full circle. Thanking them the best I could. I, my daughter, my daughter, my daughter. She was a teenager. I put her to bed one night playing with her Barbie dolls the next morning. She was missing. Gone. And the fight was on. She was drinking. My little Barbie doll daughter. <laughs> so I kept telling her that she had the potential of being an alcoholic. And she fulfilled that potential. And uh, we had a lot of bad times. A lot, a lot of bad times. I'm okay pretty much if it's a him. I can do that. I can handle it. I can do that. You know, it's easy. But it, when it comes to my kids, I'm a complete failure. I just, I just have to have so much support. I, I, it's my kids. You know, I'm the mother. I'm supposed to do something. I will not let you become an alcoholic. I've heard too many alcoholic stories, and I don't want you to be up that podium talking about that pain. So you can't, you can't be an alcoholic. You just can't. And, of course, she went her way. My son was 11, and his dad would come. We were divorced, and his dad was still drinking really bad, and he would come and do things that he shouldn't do, you know, driving drunk. And one night, he'd come home from being with his dad, and his dad had made him drink wine and got him sick. And I thought, you know, I, I just can't do this. I can't. And I got some help, and we were going to put him in the boys' ranch. And I uh, had it all in the makings, and his dad found out about it and came and kidnapped him during the day, and I didn't know where he was for a few days. And it was terrifying, absolutely. And then my son called me and said he was going to stay with his daddy and hung up. He said, I'm okay, I'm staying with my daddy. So here's both my kids gone, and I'm thinking, after all I've done for those children... 
But you know, my sponsor said, you know, you've got to let them go. And she told me to lay them at the feet of the, of the cross and leave them there. And so I did. The best of my ability, I took away the worry and I just had some concern and I could turn that concern over to God one day at a time. So I'm single, in AA and free and running around going to the conventions and the man, I mean the dances and I was in the convention in Midland, Texas and Clancy came and brought one of his sponsees. Sponsees was named Jim Shaw. And Jim sat down in front of me one night and he had big blue eyes and big, deep, gruff voice and he's a big man and diamonds. And all of that attracted me. So we started having a, a long distance relationship and it didn't turn out. He got spooked and he dumped me and, and I had just given away most of my everything, furniture, everything, quit my job, packed in the U-Haul, ready to go, and he flew in and said, I can't do this. I had a, some sort of a relationship with God at that point, but this was in gate. After all I had done for God, I took commitments in my group. I was a stupid GR in the DR, and I sponsored all these sick people. Uh, all the things I did, and this is what you give me? Really? Really? I'll show you. I'll show you. We had a clubhouse that was open all day, and I started hanging out there. I would not tell you this if my sponsor hadn't told me. She'd haunt me if I didn't. This is truth. I went there and I started my old behaviors. I know how. I know how to get a God. I'll get a man. I know how to do it. This is what you are, God. Let me show you. And I started messing with two different men, newcomers. The worst of the worst of the worst. <laughs> I was at a conference in Brownwood, Texas. And sitting out, sitting in the meeting, and the manager of the camp knew me real. I've been going there for years, and he came in during the meeting and handed me a piece of paper. And I opened it up, and it was one of the guys uh, with his phone number, and said, "Call me." Well, my sponsor saw that, and she knew who the guy was because he's a slipper. So we got out that night, and she said, "What are you doing?" And I said, "You know what." God betrayed me. I've done everything that he that you've asked me. This pro, he betrayed me. She said, "Oh, really? Do you think you ever betrayed God?" And I don't know why that sentence hit, but it hit me. And I started crying, not just crying, sobbing, from my toes all the way up. I was just sobbing. I said, "Pat, there's something about me that you don't know that I've never told so, and this is the truth." I am just unlovable. I've tried everything I know to become that way. And, and I'm just unlovable. There's something different about me. I, I don't know what it is. God does so much things for other people, but he doesn't do things for me. And I know it's because I'm unlovable. And she reached over and got me and put my head on her shoulders. And she just rocked me like you do a little baby. And she said, oh, that's not true, Benoit, because I love you with my human love. And if I can do that, can you imagine how much God can love you with his love? In an instant, forever, my life was changed. From that day to this day, I know that I know that I know God loves me. The good and the bad. He loves me. And he's got a plan for me. And I just need to watch it unfold. I know that. And a year later, Jim came back in my life, and this time I captured him, and we got married and moved out to California where he lived and started our journey, and it's been a, it was a sweet up and down. We could, I mean, I'll tell you, we were matched. Uh, I said earlier, the horns in his head fit the holes in my head. We could clear a room in 10 seconds. I mean, just... <laughs> the one thing that saved us, I think, all the time is both of us had such a passion for recovery. That's what kept us together. And we, we did a lot of good things together. He brought in two 
sickos with him, my stepdaughter Sheila and my stepson Jimmy, and they're both sober today, but boy, that was a long haul with that one. And my daughter got sober and uh, met a him on AA campus. They got pregnant, and I have a granddaughter that's just turned 30, and she's well, she I, we don't she doesn't know if she's an alcoholic or Al-Anon. She kind of goes bounces back and forth, and and you know she's an alcoholic, but she's. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I have a grandson from Sheila who was out there from 15 to 30 doing the worst of the worst of drugs. Uh, we just expected a call any day that he would be dead any day. Uh, we got calls from California, Las Vegas. Uh, Tijuana. We got calls from everywhere. And I do, I mean, if I never believed in God and miracles before, I do now. My grandson's got two years of sobriety. It was impossible. And he got two years of sobriety. Now, just for these things alone, how in the world can you ever say thank you? I mean, how can you do that? My son, uh, he, did, he, he didn't live with me again. And we had a, you know, kind of a relationship. He lived in Indiana, and I lived in California. And uh, my gym had a shoulder that hurt him one day, and, and that was in February. And he went in, and they said, you've got cancer. And three months later, he was dead. Uh, just boom. And I discovered in that time that we had, he had a business, and we had been embezzled. And there was nothing. He died. I lost my home. I lost everything. And my AA and al family took care of me. You know, when one of us is wounded, boy, we are gathered up, aren't we? And we're carried. And I had people carry me for several years. And... Uh, And then I decided it's time. I, I had a little job, and I could stay out there living with somebody, and then a big company bought our little company and fired all of us. So I decided it's time to go home to Texas. And I was telling my son about it, and he said, I'm moving to Texas. The company is transferring me. We wound up in the same little town. From Indiana to California, the same little town. And we started putting it back together. And one night we were at, at we had just gone to his cowboy church and we were at dinner and the preacher had said the most wonderful things that night. And I grabbed my hand son my son's hand and I said, I need to tell you that there are scars on my heart from my motherhood. And every now and then they pulsate. I've done all the right things about my kids. I've done a living amends, I've made amends. But every now and then those scars pulsate. And I grabbed his hand and I said, you just got to know that I just adore you and I'm so sorry you had the life that you had. He lived with a bad, mean dad that did the same thing to him he did to me and I said I hope that you forgive me and thank you for being in my life he found a blonde and uh, <laughs> they got married and she had a house a nice little three bedroom house and they put me in it to take care of me he was 46 and she was 42 and they gave me my grandson, Bodie. He's four. They bought me a car for Christmas. I mean, just loving, kind things. A second chance to be here with some dignity and some grace and just thrilled. I'm just thrilled to be with you. I got so much more and I'm already nearly out of time. This vertigo mess, you know, everybody whines about how bad they feel, but I really feel bad. (laughs) (laughs) 
seven months with only your own company most of the time is very painful. <laughs> and my sponsor starts making lists. Well, you need to do this and you need to do that. You need to do this, make a list of that. Think of all the good things that's happening. Make prayers and do this job. You know, yes, ma'am, yes, yes, ma'am. And people all over this country praying for me. I, I, I strongly believe in prayer. Strongly. Because I know that kept me sane. I believe in praying for those who are still out there. Because I know God hears them. And I know they feel it whether they know it or not. I know we do. And those are of you who still have them out there. God bless you and I am with you. And it, it will unfold. We don't know how. I had a brother that committed suicide drunk. And I remember the pain of that because he never would accept my amends ever. He quit speaking to me when I had my daughter for years. And I really wanted to make amends to him. And Dick Martin, a friend of mine, said, he made amends to you the best way he knew how. He knew he could not stop drinking. He knew he could not stop hurting people. So he just took himself out and God received him. He said, you'll carry his story. So they don't always have a happy ending, maybe. But his, I mean, his death, I carry with me and help so many people with that. So it was in vain. And I have a commitment that I need to, to keep right now. One of my girls in California had um, 35 years a couple of years ago in Al-Anon. They were throwing her a big party. And so I went. And one of the things that she asked of me was go to Catholic church with her. <laughs> oh, my grandma's going to have a fit. She sees me in a Catholic church. <laughs> So I did not want to go, and this is very important to me, I did not want to go. But I have learned here, you showed me by example to do the right thing and just wait and see what God does with it. You do the right thing and see what happens. So I did the right thing and we went. And it's a, it was a day called All Saints Day. And the priest you know, said something about Corinne's family here and she was having a birthday party and they were really kind to us. And when they were doing that ceremony of All Saints Day, he said, we have a special event today. One of the women in the parish had this, knew about the Los Angeles morgue and it was filled, stacked with unclaimed bodies, just stacked in a real mess. And she got the urge for the church to adopt one of those bodies. And so they went through it and it took them a whole year and they got it that week for the All Saints Day. And what they do is they have a little al alcove with a bunch of little lockers and that's where they put ashes of the family members of that church. So afterwards they had a little ceremony to adopt this girl, the only thing they knew about her, she was probably between 20 and 22, and her name was Margaret Berry. So they, we all went in that, and I was leaning against the wall, and I mean, it flashed against my mind. Her mother does not know what happened to her. Her mother has no way of finding out where she is. And I started crying. I mean, just kind of overreacting almost. And the priest saw me, and every, and he did like this to wait. And all the when they got through, everybody left. And he said, "Come over here." And so he invited me over. And it was a silver, looked like a coffee can, sitting in there. And he said, "Go ahead, talk to her." And I, I walked over, and I started to stroke in the top of that can. And and I said to her, Margaret. It is written that someone can stand in the gap for you, and I'm standing in the gap for your mother. And I want you to know that you're loved and that you're cared for here and that I forgive you for everything and you can rest in peace. 
I love you. And I left. And then I told that priest, he was, you know, we talked about it in my city, the mother. And he said, you can carry her message. And so from that day to this, every time I'm behind the podium, I tell you about Margaret Berry. You never know who's sitting in an audience, but I'm carrying her name. And I hope she rests in peace. Bob White, as I said, was one of our giants and one of our, I uh, just adored him. He was a big man, silver hair, good looking. Oh, he just loved, he would grab a man and kiss him right in the mouth. I mean, <laughs> oh, it was just wonderful. He got sick with cancer, and I went to see him one day. In fact, I stayed a week with him to help take care of him because I was a nurse. And he, I said, I just got back from convention, and I told him your story. And this is the story. He spoke at a Canyon conference down in Oklahoma that my husband and I started, and he was Sunday morning speaker. And he said, we close every meeting with the Lord's Prayer. He said, if you look at that, it says our Father, and then it says the power and the kingdom forever and the glory. He said, any school kid can figure out if it's a kingdom and he's our Father, that makes us royalty. We are prince and princesses of the kingdom. He said, and the power is in the rooms where we sit with each other. The power's here. And the glory is God himself in all of our faces. He said, claim your heritage. And as he was saying that, I thought, I still, you know, was having, still do from time to time my self-worth. And I thought, yes, I'm claiming that. I am Princess Fenoy. I am a child of the king. And that's my heritage, straight from y'all. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.